fact, there's nothing, because eventual sends do not block, there is no way to block in this system. Turns always run to completion. And the only, only time that a bat goes idle is when it runs out of things in its queue. Um, so there can't be any deadlock. The model is relatively straightforward. It's a little different than what we're used to thinking about, but it's fairly easy to understand. Um, it does enable distribution, which uh, threads doubt by themselves. Uh, it also more easily enables multi core use, because one of the things that keeps, uh, there's a couple things that keep most of the small talk virtual machine implementations from implementing true you know, native operating system threads. And one of them is that the potentials for interleaving uh, badly of your threads gets greater when you're interleaving it by the, at the operating system in every machine instruction boundary. But part of it is also that, um, that when you have multiple threads operating on the same memory space, that garbage collecting that memory is, is an interesting problem. Uh, Java has managed to do this, but they did not do it simply. So with a bat where you have uh, only one thread operating on the object space at one time and having, and having each bat have its own garbage collector becomes a more uh, a much easier way to do things. And there's also distributed garbage collection, of course, between the bats for all those internet references. Uh, there's also some drawbacks. We may have eliminated deadlock, but there's a thing called data lock, which results when you have a circular dependencies between um, between promises that you know promise A must be resolved before promise B can be resolved, but promise B requires promise A to be resolved before it can be resolved. And just like a deadlock, a data lock actually does bring the facts uh, in question to can can bring them to a halt or the, the plan of execution can come to a halt at that point. Um, however, these are relatively rare. Um, the anecdotal report given in Mark Miller's thesis is that they had about 60 programmers using Eve on a single large project for about, uh, for a number, of, quite a few years actually. And they had two documented uh, data lock bugs in that entire time. I'm not quite sure why they're so rare, but they also note that it's relatively easy to find data lock bugs, unlike deadlock bugs where you sometimes have to get really lucky or really unlucky in exactly what your timing is in order to expose the potential bug there. Data lock bugs tend to show up in ordinary testing. Um, also, if you have a recursive algorithm that can't be executed in a single VAT, then uh, this is a little difficult and requires some transformation of, the, of your approach, like a continuation passing style is one way to do it. So, so the, to the question of is this a good idea, my answer is probably. I'd like to try it myself uh, and get a little more experience with it, but it's a very interesting idea. Uh, seems to have some good properties. So then, to ask, well, what would this take to bring this into small talk? I would take, not, it's not too bad. There require some changes. A lot of it is straightforward. A lot of it is just you know build the build the, the wire protocol, build you know this, build the little event loop in the in the, in the VAT, you know, things that are not trivial but are fairly straightforward. You do want a, a different syntax for eventual sentence than for regular sentence. Um, you know the E language, which whose syntax is relatively Java like. Uh, it's, it's semantics are quite small time work, but its syntax is, is Java-like. And it has a different syntax for, uh, for an eventual set from an immediate set. And although it would be possible in small talk to do it with a syntax of a, of a uh, you know, without any special syntax, you'd have to send you know, this object, eventual send, colon, some message thing. It would be very unreadable. So I think you probably do want to change the syntax a little bit. A couple of ways I thought I would do that. I'm not sure what's best. Um, and I think that better support for the data objects would be a good thing. Uh, in a distributed environment like that, uh, it's really nice being able to just send the objects across the wire instead of having an eventual reference back to the map where they came from. And Smalltalk does not have a real rich tradition of immutable objects. 
there's, there's symbols, that's good, um, and there's numbers, and there's really not much more. Uh, most modern small blocks offer at least a, a basic toolkit that you could use to make immutable objects and enforce that um, as much as you enforce anything in small talk. There's usually there's a way around everything, but, but uh, you know, if you don't touch the private method, you're okay. And you know, having a better, but other, other languages offer a, a nice way to say, here's an initializer for an object, you know, initialize it, and then, then you can't change it after that. And it would be nice if there was a little more um, natural feeling support for that in small talk. And one of the things I think that we need to think about is, is whether or not uh, for data objects only, mind you, whether equal and equally equal ought to be the same. Because the question of is it the same object or not um, becomes an interesting question when you have multiple bats across all these different machines. You know, like is the symbol with the same characters in two different bats? Is it you know, is it the same object? And, and clearly, these semantics dictate that it should be the same object. And when I think about it, you know, small talks might as well. And I, I begin to wonder whether the behavior we currently have of taking objects like large integers, um, whether two equal large integers, which are, may not be you know, identical whether we really ought to be returning true if you send those, if you compare those with equal equal because they are immutable objects. Um, they really, they not only are equivalent for all purposes that you can reasonably think of as an application programmer, because they're immutable, they will stay equivalent for all time. So why are we saying they're different? So that's something to think about as well. Um, for more information on E, Go to ewrites.org. Um, there's some documentation there, and there's Mark Miller's thesis, which is really quite a good read. It's um, definitely the thesis I've read with the most references to papers by the author of the thesis. Um, he cites 20 years of his own work in industry uh, since he left. 26 years elapsed between his bachelor's degree and his PhD. Um, a lot of that time spent working on he, he had a paper at the very first Oopsla in 1986, and it was on more or less this topic, and 20 years later in 2006, he published his thesis. So, um, and I will be around all, all week if anybody, any of you are interested in talking about these or other topics or capstone stuff. So, thank you. Any questions? I don't know if you know the PhD of Tom Mankinson. Tom Mankinson from the University of uh, Fry University of Brussels because he, he worked with uh, Mark on VAT and things like that. So I think that this is worth to look. So uh, you see, so do you have an idea of imagine that you take a small tool like Faro or the works or whatever, but to give a UI? What would be the architecture of this stuff? Where would be the VAT? The architecture forming the VAT. There's a couple of options there. Um, one idea, I mean, if you want to be able to run legacy, you know, existing small talk applications that depend on threads, for instance, um, you could have a VAT that contain multiple threads. You would lose a lot of the, you would expose yourself to all the problems with threads, of course. Uh, another possibility would be to take uh, something like, uh, you know, like Faro and have it be a VAT, basically disable the multi-communication <coughs> capability of it and add in the uh, communication capability. And then you'd end up with one operating system process per VAT, which would scale to a certain point and, and not beyond. Uh, the, the most scalable architecture is one, and I think that E uses, I mean, there's two implementations that I know of E, one's based on Java and one's based on Common List. And I believe that those implementations, uh, at least one of those implementations, has a uh, multiple VATs operating with native threads inside a single same process, and then 
interact messages uh, uh, between those native threads are then handled a little faster. So that's, you know, that's a somewhat more scalable approach. But did I answer the intent of your question? You see, when we discuss about that, you are thinking, should we, do we put all the UI into the fact? What do we do for the strength there? Do we, what's happened when we evaluate code? Do we put it into an offer that? What is the communication between these? So for me, I think that this is really interesting ideas, but then how do you operationally do it? Right. This yeah. is really key question. And right, yeah. You, yeah, the programmer has to, you have to think about how to carve up the world into VATs and, and how to carve up functionality within a VAT into turns. And that's a, um, that's certainly something that I want to see more examples of and, and play with examples of to, in order to, to do that. I'd be interested in hearing any ideas you have and might want to sit down and, and like, talk about possible ways that could be done. Have you found any thoughts on whether in each map the queued message queue should be a first class object in that map and whether each message queue should have or should support messages being posted to that queue with a given priority such that for example if you had sent a message with priority 50, a queued message with priority 50 to a bat, and then you send it a message such as stop now or else you'll see what, what's coming to you, with priority 95, and it stops doing what it's doing, it's a process switch, and now you can say debug it, even in a data log. Are there any thoughts on the subject that you found so far? That's an interesting question. The, as far as I can tell, E does not use priorities. It is strictly FIFO. There's no way to get ahead in the queue. There's certainly no way to throw up the turn in the middle. Um, and I find it interesting that they were able to build a large, robust application without, without needing that. And that's you know, why they were able to do it without having priorities. I don't know, but um, there may be something about the way you construct applications with these schemes that means you don't need that kind of capability. Just, just the way possibly that's handled is assigning a VAT to an OS3 which has a priority. So maybe just the way to handle that is assigning an OS3 to call each of those VATs to an OS process which has a priority of the OS. Yeah, I think you can. I think that there was a mention of assigning priorities to a VAT as a whole, but not to uh, individual messages being being eventual sent to that VAT. Yes. Uh, what what is the benefit of sending eventual messages to your own VAT? Ah, um, that's a good question. Can you repeat? The question the was yes. The question was. Um, was what's the benefit of sending of doing an eventual send to an object in your own VAT? Uh, first of all, you may not know whether or not it's in your own VAT. It just happens to be. But even if you know it's in your own VAT, one of the ways that this can help is with um, is with a, a, a dependence kind of pattern where you where you do the change update pattern from, from Smalltalk or a similar pattern where you have some number of dependents that want to be notified of a change. One of the current problems in Smalltalk is that is that you you send you know you know change value or whatever to this to this object and then it says okay I'm going to take all my dependents and send a message to them and them and them and them and them selling them on change and then you return to the original sender and what happens if there's an error you know if one of those dependents doesn't handle the message correctly and there's an error so um, this is one of those things where where all the components have to work correctly together or the whole system kind of breaks down. Uh, whereas if you eventually send that, those messages one to each, first of all, your program then can just continue on and they will be notified uh, uh, in time. And 
Uh, but if there's an error in that, it doesn't actually get in the way of your immediate execution. So sometimes you want that immediate send, and sometimes you want the eventual send. It really depends on how tightly coupled those components are. Okay. 